It's my great pleasure here to introduce Senator Mark Warner. Uh, Senator Warner really uh, embodies in a way that I think few public servants do kind of the full uh, panoply of this conversation. Uh, prior to entering public life, Senator Warner was a, a venture capitalist who founded, a, a capitalist who founded one of the largest telecommunications companies in America. Uh, he, uh, after succeeding in the private sector, turned to become the, uh, join the public se uh, sector, served as governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, and is now uh, in his second term as a senior senator from the state of Virginia. So if you could welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Senator Mark Warner. Thank you. So, so I, I, I want to start by kind of asking what motivate you've been a leader in this thinking about the gig economy, fintech, kind of all these different worlds melding together. And I think few people appreciate the breadth of what you're in charge of in the United States Senate, right? You sit on the Banking Committee, the Finance Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Intelligence Committee, right? Literally in charge of- I'm not sure that makes me in charge of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with the entire planopy of issues in the United States and the world. And you have the same number of hours in the day as every single person in this audience. What made you choose to spend so much of your time focusing on this issue? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Aaron. And my apologies for being late. I had the day from you know where, where you have a one-hour dental appointment that turns into a three-hour dental appointment. So um, if I'm a little uh, cotton mouth, uh, excuse, my, um, uh, excuse my presentation. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that a lot of politics should be more defined future versus past rather than left versus right. And I was lucky enough back in the early 80s to get involved in the wireless industry. I'd gone to law school at Harvard and all my law school classmates were all at big fancy law firms. And I kept trying to say, you know, we gotta get involved in this whole cell phone business. Every one of them said to me, Warner, you are so crazy. Go get a real job. Who's gonna want a cell phone? <laughs> they are still practicing law, and I got rich off of that. I co-founded Nextel. And at that moment in time, people anticipated it would take 30 years to build out a wireless network, and at the end of those 30 years, it would be 5% penetration. Obviously, conventional wisdom was wrong. So after the 2014 cycle, I started thinking, you know, let's take a look at this changing nature of the economy. Um, I got initially interested in the gig uh, and on-demand platforms. But relatively speaking, that is still a fairly small share of our workforce. We're still kind of in the hockey stick stage where it's going up. But what it led me to is, is something I think much more profound, and frankly, that I didn't fully appreciate, that most large corporates starting in the 90s, if you were not core to that corporate's function, you got outsourced. Whether it was literally abroad or figuratively, you know, firm here at uh, here at home, and we see that with people like uh, you know cafeteria workers, janitors, what have you. And what what's happened over the last 25 years is we now have a third, at least a third of the workforce that is in some level of contingent work, 1099 independent contractor, two part-time jobs, short-term W-2. Uh, but the problem with that, and there are some great opportunities there, flexibility and other things. The challenge comes is that we're the only industrial nation in the world that built its social contract based upon your work status. You only get unemployment, workman's comp, disability, health, retirement, if you are, in effect, uh, a full-time employee. That, to me, is a fundamental problem. Uh, we've got to create, I believe, a social insurance network that meets workers where they're at, and that, to my mind, means a portable, portable benefit system. Who runs that system? How is it composed? Um, that's subject of debate. Who manages these individual accounts? But I think from the first dollar earned, a portion of that dollar ought to attach to you and be broken into some of these categories. What particularly interested me in FinTech is because of this change in the workforce, what we have now is enormous income volatility. Uh, J.P. Morgan's done a study, so it's about 60% of the workforce having a 40% volatility over a, a quarterly basis. We've all seen the Federal Reserve data that said 47% of Americans couldn't absorb an unexpected $400 bill without defaulting into one of the you know, less than savory uh, credit access. So what got me excited about FinTech was 
could fintech be, as we talk about with Evans and the others, this bridge, because even if your income top line number looks good, if you are contingent and you have no ability to protect, could some of these tools accessed by your phone be a way to help folks manage through this changing nature of work and the changing nature of our economy? I do not believe we're going back to an economy where people are going to work for the same firm for 40 years the way my dad did. So I think we have to be willing to kind of lean forward and, and you know, meet workers where they're working. That means a portable benefit system. It also means fintech, while there are enormous challenges with it, has an opportunity to bridge part of that, um, uh, that new social contract. Last point, and then we'll get to the next question, which is you know, if you were thinking about a social contract in the 21st century, I would argue that one of the most essential components of that social contract ought to be that emergency four or $500 fund that you can draw down, say, once a year. Because with the level of income volatility, stuff happens. And in the old economy, you might not make much, but you at least had predictability. You don't have that predictability. And FinTech could be um, one of the tools to bridge that. No, I, I, uh, here. So I think... I think you're right, and I think that's what uh, Quinton was talking about with Even, about the need to bring new products to address that the problem, and it's often misunderstood in small dollars, often the problem is income volatility, not expense volatility. Right. right. The story that we're told about your transmission breaking down, and that's why you need small dollar, is true about one out of six times. And the other five out of six times, it's in income variance. Uh, but I want to pick up on a, a, a point that Dave made uh, 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 from Sunrise Bank, which was just stunning to me to hear a banker say a checking account isn't going to save your life. And he's right. And I'll tell you a story, you know, life imitates art. So on Saturday morning, I went to the, my local bank branch in Silver Spring, Maryland to deposit a check with my three-year-old daughter. And it's training early. Yes. Lollipop equal, bank equals lollipop equals good is the equation that I've impressed into her. Um, but w w what struck me was there was a, a teller, a uh, a woman, uh, 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 African-American actually, at the teller next to me who comes up and says, here's a check, I need this to clear, when will it clear? And the teller says, this is gonna clear on Wednesday. This was Saturday morning, Monday's Columbus Day. This check's gonna clear Wednesday. She said, well, I have some credits coming up, some credits on my debit card that are automatically gonna come up between now and Wednesday. I need this check to cover them. And the teller said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not gonna clear. She said, what's gonna happen? She says, well, you're gonna be charged an overdraft fee. Well, how much is that? That's 36 bucks. Was that only gonna be once, she asks, or for each one, because I have a couple of these. And the teller says, each one. She says, well, what am I gonna do? And the teller looks at her. Checking account isn't gonna save your life. The woman behind me in line goes to her and goes, why don't you go to the check cashier around the corner? They're only 20 bucks, and you can come back here with cash. And the woman looks to the teller and goes, well, will that work? And the teller goes, yeah, the cash will clear in your account today. So she walked out of the bank. This is a banked person being sent to a check casher because our payment system can't deposit a check from Saturday morning until Wednesday. And it's that crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. And it is one of the, and, and again, the previous panel were the debate between financial institutions and fintech. Who is gonna, who's going to shrink that gap and do it with as least friction as possible? Um, it's one of the reasons why I am very intrigued uh, on the whole question around blockchain. You know, obviously there are, there are transparency issues. We held one of the first hearings on Bitcoin. It took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around that uh, and how that gets implemented. Uh, but uh, you know, it is crazy in the 21st century that it takes four days to clear for a check to clear. And you are both creating a business opportunity and you are also putting an enormous burden on a wide segment of Americans who just don't have that flexibility to go th that extra week. Right. That has no impact to me. The check clearing time doesn't matter to me, doesn't matter to a lot of people in the audience, but to the 75% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck, that's real money out of their Absolutely. pocket. So how are we gonna, I mean, how is government, what's government's role to fix this problem? Well, I think government's role is to, one, encourage innovation. Two, it would be when we think about all of the, particularly for that low-income person, the number of bill pay, bills due 
to governmental type entities, whether it's the water company, the power company, you know, other kind of necessities of life, your taxes. You know, I think we really need to work with the incumbents on having a more flexible uh, payment schedule in terms of what time of the month those bills are due. Um, I think one of the one of the interesting things that people have attracted that have attracted people to the gig economy is the fact that oftentimes that results in immediate payment. So the notional idea of you know do people really need to be paid every two weeks? Should they be paid every week or every day? These are all things that I think we ought to sort through. Um, and I think you know if government at least starts with a more flexible basis on when it expects its payments yeah. to come in, that would be at least a step in the right direction. Well, I, th I, th I think that'll be right. And I'd, I'd add, I think the Federal Reserve is the check processing clearing center of, of the country ought to get with the times and either force that or have industry force it. I think one of the nice aspects of blockchain and these other technologies that are coming out is they're motivating the incumbent banking network to move faster. And you see things like real-time uh, settlement from the clearinghouse. I mean, the banking industry, I think, is seeing this threat uh, of remember, fintech it, and an opportunity. But they're seeing a threat, but remember, for a long time it's been a great profit center. Having these delays you know, allows you to charge that overdraft fee. So this is a, yeah. this is a very, uh, you know, this is why we need to encourage you know, our fintech partners to kind of get out there to put pressure on trying to close down some of these um, inefficiencies. So that kind of gets to this, the question about fin versus tech. And I've been thinking more about this word. It, it's, it's a little bit of this awkward area where you have the financial folks thinking, I'm going to improve my tech platform. I'm going to go online. I'm going to have an app. I'm going to improve my tech platform. And then you have tech folk thinking, you know what? There's a giant opportunity for me in finance. And you're kind of existing in two different words, and, and, and the common hashtag up here has kind of blurred them together into one fintech. Uh, how do you see this? You know, with your experience from technology, your experience as a senior member on the banking committee, understanding finance, where do you see the worlds well, of fin well, it and may tech? Also, it may also, as we think more and more about mobile payments, you may have large other entities coming into the enterprise. You know, will the telcos suddenly be your bank? Will some of the social media com co companies who pervade so much you know, in terms of how we get our information, you know, will Google be your bank? Uh, so I think this is a, a kind of a little bit of a Wild West space. Um, the challenge is how we allow innovation. Uh, I'm not there on the fact of a complete safe harbor because you could see bad products arise very quickly and you know, how do you roll those back? I am intrigued with what's happening with, in the UK where they've got a, uh, the Bank of England is, I understand, doing kind of a, a fintech accelerator. Um, this is a space that we're going to, you know, as, as somebody who's interested in this, I need your input on how we get this right. I mean, because we've, we've got to, I see my friend Jonathan Miller here, we, we worked long and hard on, on pieces of Dodd-Frank. Some parts we got right, some parts probably need some revision. But, you know, you've got consumer protection, you've got safety and soundness. Where does all this fit within a FinTech new product world? Um, I do think some of the comments about if you've got FDIC insurance, there is obviously going to be a higher bar on, on Prudential, but there also has to be a consumer protection piece on the front end because we have seen uh, some of these products be almost advertised as too good to be true, and they have been too good to be true. They've actually ripped off folks. So I'm anxious to have input on how we, how we balance this. Th that's incredibly important because traditionally my marker for is a product predatory is is it marketed on yes and fast. If something says you're pre-approved immediately, beware, right? That's usually you know, a, 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 a telltale sign. Uh, and there are reasons, behavioral psychology reasons, and Nadine pointed out that people have been denied credit that's a huge psychological cost, and their desire to avoid the potential for denial again will, will motivate them, even if the terms of that product are less than stellar. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, one of the beauties of fintech is offering both uh, a decision and immediacy, whereas the delays in the existing system. But I, I want to I kind of think a little bit about the future. I mean, you know, you saw cell phones when folks didn't. 
right? You know, we, w when I was in Congress and we did this, this uh, Check 21, it was all about being able to deposit checks in an ATM, and nobody saw this smartphone thing in your bed, in, in anywhere you want to deposit a, a check, and you know, let alone Apple Pay and all these other you know, new innovative forms. What, you know, if we're back here in, in five years and you have the beauty of thinking in six-year increments from time to time a little bit, thank our founders for at least getting, getting one, giving one person in Washington a longer perspective. Although our, in terms of our record of output, even in six-year increments has been a little mixed. Um, uh, where are we get, what are going to be these innovations that you think, if all the keys are turned right, if government is a constructive partner, if innovations work, what are the things you're looking for that could change the fintech landscape if we're back here again in four or five years' time? Well, I think if, if we see the fintech entities writ large improve access to credit, improve transparency, if we think as well, you know, one of the, if, if gig and the changing nature of the social contract is not big enough, I also increasingly am worried that uh, you know, modern American capitalism in many ways is not working for enough people. And that is partially driven by enormous focus on short-termism over long-term value creation, which I think is a cancer eating at our system. And one of the areas where people are, uh, that, are that troubles me the most is you know, because people are not going to work for the same firm for a long time, it used to be if you went and worked for, this, worked for the same firm and you got hired on the factory floor, that firm would invest in you and upskilling you over a period of time because chances are you're going to work there for 20 years. Now, there is virtually no rational incentive for any firm to invest in the upskilling and training of people, say, that make below 65000 or 75000 So when you've got globalization, when you've got technology, when you've got artificial intelligence, th that wide swath of Americans are understandably pretty upset. And you see that from both ends of the political spectrum. I don't think it is an overstatement to think that fintech could be morphed into not only kind of better economic training, but there could be a whole series of other training delivery through your mobile device that might allow people to become upskilled. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, how do, we get, how do we get those incentives right? One, I would argue that um, um, we need to think about it. I know this is a bit off topic here, but you know, if we need to think about incentives, I believe business generally does a better job of workforce training than government, but potentially even looking at incentives that might go from a deduction to a credit and have that credit worth more than a dollar so that the company receives the benefit even if the person moves on. We've got to recognize we've got to have a much more aggressive way to upskill people in the workforce, particularly low and moderate income folks. And there will be an enormous number of intersection points. One of those intersection points might be you know, your relationship with that fintech provider. So I have, I have one more question, then want to turn to the audience. And it gets back a little bit to the role of government. And, and Nat said something about how uh, pinpointing the IRS and modernizing a specific form would be just a, a great way to unleash innovation. And I think about what President Clinton did with opening up GPS, right? Every time I am lost, I, in the back of my mind, thank President Clinton for opening up GPS. I don't think people fully appreciate that that innovation was brought to you by forward-thinking government. Now, I also had the opportunity to serve uh, for, for Senator Sarbanes, who served on the Budget Committee, as did, mm -hmm. as did you. And I remember Budget Committee markups, which are kind of Wild West moments in the, in the Senate where amendments are putting out on the, on the fly in their real-time votes. And one of the great uh, offsets when you wanted to increase whatever it was that was your favorite uh, increase was to slash the IRS technology budget. <laughs> and so do you want more education or more IRS technology? Do you want more clean water or IRS technology, right? Real tough votes. Um, and, and so, you know, I remember at one budget hearing, the clerk had to interrupt and said, the budget is now negative. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sorry, don't worry, we'll fix that. Um, but like, you know, and here we are realizing that the, re the result of that is a lack of innovation because ironically, we've kind of starved the parts of government 
that are necessary to unlock the private sector innovation. And so where, kind of my question to you is, where can government lead, where can government follow, and where does government need to get out of the way to unlock well, fintech? Well, one, one thing, and we've seen this looking, for example, at the, um, at uh, just the, the extent of the gig workforce. You know, BLS had not done a survey of contingent workers for more than a decade plus. That, that means that survey is about as valuable as it had been done in the 1890s rather than the early 2000s. Um, we tried to get the IRS to change some of the, the form in terms of retirement accounts so you can do it in a more simplified way. I do believe, in, and I'm, you know, I'm relentlessly bipartisan, um, sometimes to the uh, detriment of my, some of the folks that I serve with, but you cannot continue to have the starve the beast mentality about your general revenue collector. If you want that entity to be flexible and help make, meet people where their needs are, you can't default to that being the whipping post. And right now you've got an enterprise that is not able to deal with even late 20th century innovation, let alone 21st century innovation. So that's an area where you know, a more efficient, effective government, um, I think, would be, uh, would be needed. I think there's, you know, one of the debates that we're going to have, um, you know, who, who owns your data? You know, who owns, you know, is it, is it the social media? Is it your telecom? You know, can we allow the actual consumer to have access to full ownership of their financial data in a way that's a lot more transparent? That's an area where I think government needs to push that, push that along. Um, I think that getting this balance right between innovation and consumer protection is a fine, that's a hard one to walk, particularly when you've got products that can come out so quickly and be here for a while and then you know, can wreak great havoc very quickly if we're not careful. Uh, so I'm, again, open for business on how we, how we try to balance that right. I think we can't come in, we, we can't go, we can't go back. One thing we can't do is I didn't think about this more kind of where I was a year and a half ago um, on looking at the gig economy and the changes of the workforce. We are not going to fix the changing nature of our economy by going back to a binary choice in employment status between W-2 and 10999. It's going to need to be a much more robust a much more flexible. I think the same kind of area, has, that same kind of approach of not backwards looking, but forward looking is going to have to apply uh, as we talk about this subject. Great. Well, I think we have time for a couple brief questions from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand, state who you are, where you're from, and please ask a question. So who do we have um, in the back row right there? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you for a wonderful discussion. You talk about leaning forward and the IRS, can we accelerate B Corp becoming the standard corporate structure so that we move away from this 501c3, 501c3d, whatever, that nonprofit, for-profit juxtaposition so that corporations can invest beyond what's in it for them. You see the, the, the direction of SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Bureau, um, locking in on, on working with, with the SEC directly on reporting. That's about valuation of assets. And if we're going to have a different social contract, we need to, to, to stop having chameleon eyes on, on nonprofit versus for profit, B Corp is here. Let's make it federal and truly get over the the, the wave of, of our history. Well, I, let me try to address a couple points. One, I do think there needs to be a, an examination of fiduciary duty that means that meets the qualification of long term value creation, not simply how much you can bring to the bottom line over the next two quarters. Because frankly, a lot of stock owners now are not owners; they're renters. And something is fundamentally different. I grew up in, as a, in the free enterprise system, but something is fundamentally different when you've seen the last quarter, 95% of the, 
of all corporate pro profits spent on share buybacks and dividends and not in terms of reinvesting in, in enterprises, workforce, and training. You know, what gives me optimism in a place that is not always very optimistic uh, is candidly millennials. I think millennials will vote with their dollars and their um, where they want to work in terms of working for and working with more responsible companies. I think this will be the case in fintech. And your comment about B Corp, I'm not sure that we're going to see a federally legislated B Corp. But I do think with B Corp, with SASB, Paul Tudor Jones has got trying to create a corporate ranking called Just Capital. I just came uh, from a session this week in New York on a group that's called Inclusive Capitalism. There is a series of businesses around conscientious capitalism. What we need, I would argue, is these are all nascent efforts that have really kind of grown up post-Great Recession. But I have a lot of hope for this area. What I would hope, though, is that some of the funders and foundations could actually encourage these groups to work more collaboratively and come up with a single brand that consumers and others would recognize. Because right now, we've got lots of furor going on. Uh, but to an average consumer, average millennial, they don't know where to turn to get that kind of metric-driven notions that an investor and a consumer could look to. All right, so question, woman in the back. And then if it's brief, we'll have time for one more. So hopefully a carrot. Hi, uh, thanks for coming in today. Um, Lolita Clozel with American Banker. Um, so you mentioned that the government should encourage uh, innovation and finance. And finance. Um, I was wondering if you have any specific ideas of what uh, the, gov the banking regulators can do today to encourage fintech innovation. Well, I think, you know, again, as the earlier panel said, you know, banking regulator always starts with prudential safety and soundness. You know, that's just their mindset. And candidly, we probably want them to keep that, that focus. I think one of the most important things that could happen is within the regulators, a lot more exchange between where FinTech is at, more kind of back and forth discussion, regulators bringing on more people that are more versed in technology. I think this is less a single regulatory change than a recognition that the world is going to change, and it's going to change a lot faster than the regulators, I think, we recognize. And they're going to have to get up to speed on the, on the tech space, um, I think, to kind of get that right. I'm not a very satisfactory answer, but I don't think, I don't know what this silver, you know, regulatory change that's going to, that's going to get it right. Great. Time for one last, uh, one last question. Um, Ma'am? My name is Melanie Avery. I work with an organization called Veterans on the Rise. It's a 51 c 3 that services homeless veterans and veteran families. And my question relates to the banking fees, um, the scenario that you brought up at the beginning of the um, panel. What will it take to convince the banking institutions to make adjustments in terms of how quickly um, and how efficiently they process those payments when they're making millions and billions of dollars of fees every year on you know, that segment of the population that is living paycheck to paycheck? Well, I would argue, one, you know, people like me need to push the Fed to speed up this process. And two, some of our previous panel and others need to come up with products that will undercut the incumbent. You know, one of the, one of the opportunities around fintech as well is, you know, you can actually make it worthwhile to deal with much smaller amounts of capital. And the friction costs uh, should go down dramatically. You know, this should be a great business opportunity. But we've seen, we've seen some well-intentioned, but we've also seen some overreach even in, within FinTech in the last two years that we have to be you know, careful about. And that's, again, why I think transparency and, call, and being willing to call out the bad actors. I would argue that you know, the, the, the notion of individual to individual lending was a lot healthier space before all the hedge funds got in. And so you know, we, we have to just uh, stay vigilant. Great. Well, Senator Warner, I hope this chair was more pleasant than the dentist. It was definitely a step up. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.